where do we need to get to uh, some good examples, both small and large projects. So we invite you to come back each month as those themes develop. So overall, we are definitely uh, wanting to achieve a national BIM mandate for Canada. That's the focus for this uh, trimester. It is the core of our roadmap that we've developed for all of uh, the industry, for all of industry. The question is, are we ready for a mandate? How do we structure it? Who else has done this? What does a mandate, what does a mandate entail? And what are the priority areas for a national BIM mandate in Canada? So those questions have shaped who we've gone uh, out to have as speakers uh, for us. And today is no exception. We're very proud to have um, two excellent speakers today. This is a picture of our roadmap. It's available on the website, buildingsmartcanada.ca. Um, as you can see, the roadmap follows uh, specific themes and it leads to achieving a comprehensive national BIM mandate. This is meant for all of industry, not that uh, we see ourselves doing every piece of this, um, but we do um, see the value and the absolute importance of having a roadmap to, to organize our national, um, our national BIM community around. So without further ado, today's uh, speakers, Mr. Bilal Sukar and Mr. Mohammed Kassam, are going to speak to us on their research and findings on BIM policy development. What they're going to show are, we, there may be many different countries, but there are certain common approaches that, um, that we can follow. Can you advance me one more there, Eric? Oh, there we go. So just a little bit about our speakers. Um, Bilal is based out of uh, Australia. Uh, he's done an extensive amount of work in this area of, um, of competency assessment, of performance assessment, uh, of defining, uh, defining learning outcomes, defining performance improvement, and then now mo what we're talking about today is the BIM policy development aspect. If you want to learn more, if you haven't heard of uh, Bilal or his work, he does have a number of sites up that are of uh, quite of significant interest. Um, Eric, unfortunately, I'm having trouble advancing the deck here. Very sorry. There we are. BIM Think Space, BIM Framework, BIM Excellence, and BIM Dictionary, all are excellent resources. And I encourage each of you, if you're interested in this subject area, um, to go ahead and dig a bit further on all of the work that he's uh, posted on those four sites. And Dr. Mohammed Kassam, who is based out of the UK, um, has teamed up with uh, Bilal for some time and, and they've been working together, um, I want to say a couple of years now, you can correct me, uh, especially in the BIM policy development area. So we're very interested to see your collaboration and, and how that's proven fruitful. Um, as of late, uh, both Mohammed and Bilal have um, been able to deliver many presentations around the world. Um, as well as publish a number of articles, papers, and, and other information um, that you can have access to through those sites on the previous slide. Both are very advanced in their field. And this shows a little bit of the evolution of, of, um, of the research and the focus of their work. So starting with macro BIM policy issues identified back in 2010. Through 2011, the macro BIM team formed. 2013, the first paper published on the topic. 2014, a policy development consultancy uh, began and was completed and ready for, for market. And this just this past year, 2015, a report published and a new macro research output, which we'll see some of today. Oh, 
So, uh, Susan here, uh, I, I, um, let's hand it over to, um, to Bilal and, and Mohammed, uh, and maybe uh, you can take it, uh, take it away, um, Bilal, uh, and uh, just go through these papers that, that, that outline your, your research and then uh, lead us into the presentation of the research. Okay, thank you, Eric and Susan, and thank you all for attending this presentation. Um, there's a few papers covering uh, macro policy adoption from different perspectives. Uh, these are available to download, and I'm hoping that uh, at the end of the session you'll be pointed to where to download this whole presentation, and you can, if you have some time, free time in the evening and there's nothing to do, there's uh, a few papers uh, to read. Um, how do I advance these slides, Eric? Um, so you should have access, uh, you should have the, uh, yeah, and so just down the, uh, if you take your mouse and point it in the lower uh, left-hand corner, there's okay. the uh, uh, okay, arrows. Thank you. Okay, we, we've done a, a few of these presentations uh, worldwide. Um, there's a few coming as well. Um, sorry, I'm <clears throat> to find the arrow. Okay, so this presentation is in two parts. We're gonna be doing it like a tag team between me and uh, Muhammad. I'll, I'll be starting, uh, Muhammad will take uh, the middle part and then I will, I will end uh, the presentation leading into the Q&A. Uh, so first uh, we're gonna try to understand what are the BIM policy challenges and how to address these challenges, the three sections involved in, in here. Then developing a BIM policy roadmap, a case study sample template. So I'm just gonna quickly go into the first part. So what are these uh, BIM policy challenges? And how do we address them? So um, the main BIM policy challenges that we encountered through our research is that there is uh, a lack of decision support methods and tools. Meaning, uh, if, if a policymaker wants to um, make a, a decision about a policy, how to structure a policy, or how to make a, a you know, uh, who to engage, uh, there's no decision support uh, tools available for these policy makers. The focus over the years have been more on organizational implementation, but there's not much work done, uh, research, evidence-based work done to help these policy makers. The second thing is that there are no benchmarks um, to assess and compare whole markets. So really, there are just a few of these um, market-driven surveys that tells us how many software prices have been sold, uh, etc. and there's no real benchmarks to, to help uh, the decision makers to make the decisions. So this is one of the, the main challenges. And the uh, third, uh, um, last but not least here is that uh, there's no clarity in all the tens, if not hundreds of um, BIM documents available out there, the guides, the protocols and, and mandates. And um, this really um, poses a significant challenge to anyone who tries to study um, what's available and what's not available uh, across the world. So the first challenge, um, we try to address that through developing something called conceptual model. So a, a model, a kind of a, of a, of a mini framework for, to, to help these policy makers to develop their policies. Um, so we developed five of these uh, models. I'm gonna go through them quickly. There's of course not enough time to go through them in detail. Uh, the first one is called uh, diffusion areas uh, model. And this one has nine areas. Uh, there are nine metrics in total. So you've got uh, something called, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the BIM stages index. You've got something called modeling, collaboration, integration. These are the stages that a, an organization would pass through from pre-BIM uh, to highly advanced BIM. These are the capability stages or minimum capability. And you've got the three main topics, uh, which are technology, process, and policy, uh, which cover all topics needed by an organization in order to move from pre-BIM to uh, highly advanced or full BIM. And by uh, mapping these two together, you get these nine areas, which help us to identify uh, we can measure these nine areas separately or, or together, will help us to identify uh, the true uh, adoption or diffusion uh, of them across the market. So we can see how many uh, companies are still uh, you know, struggling with just modeling technology or they have developed some modeling processes or they have some modeling protocols, for example, at the lowest um, uh, you know, row 
or they have moved up, they now have uh, using the collaboration technology, or they have uh, already adopted some collaboration processes and workflows, or they are using uh, collaboration standards, etc. So these nine areas uh, were used uh, in a, a research questionnaire uh, which was completed uh, end of last year, and Mohammed will be covering some of the results. So this is the first model, the fusion areas model. Uh, this model is available, uh, there's a video uh, for, you know, covering this model is also available in a couple of languages, other languages. The second um, model, which we'll encounter uh, also later on, is called the macro maturity components. Now, the idea behind this model is to identify all the topics uh, needed to be addressed by a policymaker as they, um, you know, try to develop a policy. And these eight components um, are objective stages and milestones, whether there are objectives for, you know, clear objectives, uh, clear milestones for, uh, for the adoption, uh, whether there are champions and drivers within the market, are they, well, uh, you know, are they just champions or are they drivers? Drivers are, are, are the ones that are selected by, by a, maybe a government, or champions are mostly volunteers. Is there a regulatory framework to, to govern uh, the adoption? Is there any contracts, uh, protocols, etc.? cetera? Uh, what are the, you know, the number of what's called noteworthy publications, the guides, protocols, and mandates, and, and, and how they are distributed? I mean, is there lots of guides, not, not enough uh, protocols? Is there standards, there are no standards? And we'll cover this uh, a little more detail later on. Is there a learning and education framework within a country? Um, is there measurements and, and benchmarks? Uh, is there a way to measure the adoption of uh, organizations, the competencies of individuals, etc.? Is there a way to measure uh, improvement? Are there standardized parts and deliverables? Uh, you know, do you have uh, an object library? Um, do they are, are outputs well defined? in order to be used in protocols? Is there a technology infrastructure, which is a very important aspect, especially in developing uh, countries? So these, these are the eight topics that a policy maker will need to address. And uh, the, the model identifies these eight and maps them against the five maturity levels, which also we, we, we've measured through our uh, research. And Mohammed will provide some information about the results. The third model is called the diffusion dynamics model, and it uh, clarifies how you know BIM diffusion uh, occurs, or any kind of information system diffuses within a market, and it identifies uh, you know a number of things. Uh, the first we call them diffusion dynamics, which is a, a top-down and bottom-up, which are you know fairly common. People understand what top-down and bottom-up is, but also there is a third dynamic which is often missed, which we call the the middle out. And so top-down is when, for example, uh, a government uh, would uh, mandate something and push it down into the value chain, uh, while uh, a bottom-up would be when small organizations adopt an information system like uh, them, and over time it diffuses up uh, the supply chain. While middle-out, which is one of the most prominent uh, diffusion dynamics and uh, least researched, is that when uh, large companies or uh, institutions or maybe the defense department adopts an information system and through their size and, and you know influence in the market they could uh, diffuse it down the, their supply chain or value chain and up into uh, the government through lobbying and there are these these different dynamics can be understood through certain what's called pressure mechanisms um, you know down upward horizontal and pressure types um, something called coercive, you know, by force, normative, when something becomes the norm that everybody will need to adopt anyway, or th through mimetic or imitation. And this is one of the most uh, really um, important pressures, imitation. Also, this model is available in different languages, and there's a short video covering it. Model D, or fourth uh, model, is called policy actions model, and uh, this it clarifies uh, how different you know, policymakers need to take or are taking different approaches in different markets, and these are, depend on 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 the you know the market and the approach of the policymakers. And uh, this model identifies um, uh, nine policy actions by mapping two things. So they've got rows and columns. So we have something called policy approaches. Now policy approaches here. 
uh, we've got a passive approach. So when the policymaker is really passive about the uh, adoption or active, uh, it, there's a bit more action involved in it. It's not about just, uh, uh, just uh, watching how the market is evolving. You know, there's some action involved. Or assertive, it's when a policymaker is not only taking action, but is forceful about it. And so we overlay these three policy approaches with um, uh, three policy activities, which uh, we refer to as uh, communicate, engage, and monitor. And by overlaying these, um, you know, uh, approaches and activities, we get these nine areas, which we also can measure uh, using our research uh, methodology and identify how a market um, is adopting them and so what policy actions. Is it all passive? Is it all active? Or is it a mix of uh, active and assertive, etc.? And uh, uh, we'll show you a little bit of uh, some of the results we, we found. Fifth and uh, last uh, model, we call it model E, or the diffusion responsibilities model, identifies all the player groups, all the you know, stakeholders that need to be involved or should be involved or are involved in a market uh, when a diffusion policy is adopted. Uh, if so, if this, this model uh, helps uh, policymakers to identify who uh, should be involved in what part of the policy development, it also helps us researchers to measure who, who's been involved in market A as compared to market B, market C and C, uh, what role has a certain type of player played? So these uh, nine groups are the, uh, these uh, are actually eight groups and the individual, which are not covered in, in, in measuring uh, macro uh, dynamics here. So policy makers, education institutions, look at construction organizations, um, look at the technology developers like you know, the Autodesk, et cetera, et cetera. We look at uh, technology service providers, their uh, value added resellers or training institutions, et cetera. And industry associations like the Institute of Architects, Engineers. Um, let's look at communities of practice, the Revit user group, Archicad user group, et cetera. Uh, and uh, technology advocates, uh, which are uh, sort of building smart, which uh, uh, you know, advocate the information systems uh, uh, through policy and by encouraging industries to move uh, in a specific direction. So these, these uh, groups are also uh, measured. We can measure them using this model to see the difference between markets. And also this model, all these models actually help either in measurement of uh, you know, adoption dynamics within a, a country, a market, or to provide tools for policymakers uh, to decide what to do. So whether, uh, who should they engage? What kind of diffusion dynamics should they adopt? Uh, what is the level of diffusion within a market based on specific metrics? Okay. And all right, I'll, I'll hand over now to Muhammad. Um, Okay, uh, thank you, Bilal. Uh, thank you, Susan, Eric, and Carl for the invitation. Thank, thanks to all those listening. Uh, I'll cover three, uh, three uh, short sections in my slot. The first one, really, I'll uh, go through the result we obtained from applying the five models in, uh, in about 2020 20 country. Uh, I'm trying to, yeah, uh, basically, I need to go back. Yeah, we we, are, we applied the five models in 20 countries. The country you have, you see here listed on, on this slide, the country cover almost every continent except Africa because we didn't have enough respondents from Africa. We had about uh, more than uh, about 95 experts who responded uh, and we included all countries with more than three respondents. So I'll show you the result model by model, what the result, uh, what data we, uh, obtained from the application of each model. Uh, the first one, uh, by the way, by, when I show the result, I'll not be able to show all 20 countries. I'll show a sample of countries, but the trend or pattern is the same if you consider all 20 countries. This is the first model which measure uh, the nine area of diffusion Bilal uh, uh, just introduced. What, you, what we can see from this, that like, uh, 
First of all, some countries have some diffusion gap. Uh, each color represents here a diffusion area, so each line in each country should have ideally nine colors. You can see some countries like Malaysia, Malaysia they have already some uh, diffusion gap. They have uh, two areas of diffusion completely missing. Other countries like Hong Kong and Finland, they have, uh, like Finland and China, uh, they have all area of diffusion and the distribution is somehow balanced. In most of the other countries, the distribution is not balanced. So this show us, this basically is telling us like uh, the non area of diffusion are different, are distributed differently or uh, within the same country and across countries. And an interesting trend we identified by applying this model is if you add uh, the three area, if you add the three areas, the score for the three field, uh, the score for the three field for modeling, collaboration, integration, you will find the same trend across all country that modeling it's the area, uh, the high, the most, the highly diffused area, and followed up by collaboration and integration. And this was an interesting trend that we found it common across all country. Uh, the second model. The second model, which uh, basically we are measuring the maturity of each of the eight topics. Uh, what we found in terms of cumulative, like if you add, uh, if you add uh, the score for all for all eight areas, you will find that the United the UK is has the highest maturity, uh, the cumulative maturity. If we if you add all of them. Uh, uh, the, the interesting result from this model is uh, you could see straight away that there are some countries that they have gap in their like uh, uh, country maturity in terms of BIM. Look, for example, Switzerland here, you have just three topics available within their market. So if like the Swiss, is, uh, if policymaker in Switzerland would like to start next year, for example, a policy development, they, they know just from this result what they should focus the effort on because they know they have five of the eight area completely missing and they could look across all other countries which country is has the highest maturity in certain topics and they could try to learn from that country. If I isolate, for example, one component instead of putting all component across all countries in the same graph, if I isolate one component and here I am taking the objective stasis and milestone, you can see straight away where country are, uh, what, what's the maturity of uh, this topic across country. And here again, you can see the UK has the highest maturity because we have uh, uh, the level two, which has, which was defined uh, uh, with all stages and milestones since 2011. Uh, all, all other countries are, have still uh, medium low maturity or low maturity in terms of their uh, market, uh, wide objective stages and milestone. So again, this is, uh, for example, in Switzerland, you see there isn't any market uh, scale uh, objective and stage uh, uh, and milestones. So again, this, this, if you analyze component by component, you can straight away have a clear idea about who is ahead of the curve and try to learn from those countries. Moving on to the next model, which is a diffusion dynamic, uh, it's very interesting to see that in 15 of the 20 countries, we identified that uh, diffusion dynamic is the middle out. Basically, you, we have large uh, organization, could be uh, uh, professional uh, bodies or communities of practice influencing uh, the adoption of BIM. Could, this could be, could, be, uh, could be unfolding downward to smaller organization or upward to uh, to large uh, government or government bodies. It's interesting to know, it's interesting to as well remark uh, that this is really, like all assessment in, uh, of all models, this is very time dependent. If I give you the example of Spain, uh, Spain, when we applied this model, uh, when at the time of the therapy, was really considered bottom up. Uh, but now, now it's uh, at this moment in time, like three months after we finished our data collection, it is really a middle out. Basically, it started with small engineering firms, small architectural firm. They diffused this to middle out to large uh, uh, organization and large professional bodies. And the large professional body are now 
even lobbying the government to mandate them and it will become top down. So, uh, so these three dynamics, they shouldn't be seen as independent. Uh, in in two countries, so in other countries where there is a clear mandate, uh, it's uh, like Hong Kong, United uh, Arab Emirates, UK. It is obviously top down. Although this is really not accurate, the respondent have confused this because at the time we have done the survey, the mandate wasn't in place, but uh, it it was still considered as the most influential dynamic, which is influencing adoption, which is true. Moving on to the next model, this one is basically showing uh, the policy policy action used uh, by policy makers in the different countries. Thirteen of the countries here, they have an approach which is fully passive. When I say it's fully passive, I don't mean we don't mean really that the the policy maker is doing nothing. But when we go on this line, when you go from left to right, the intensity by which policy maker encourage BIM adoption increases. So basically here in, in 13 countries, uh, the approach was basically about encouraging, uh, uh, observing, and, uh, uh, and uh, basically spreading awareness. In uh, one country, which is the Netherlands, we had a slightly more, uh, more uh, active approach in uh, terms of communication. The policymakers have provided all guides, uh, all what's needed for the industry to, uh, uh, to, to facilitate adoption, has provided some incentives. In terms of monitoring, currently it's, it's observing. Uh, other countries, and other, in some of the other countries, we have in five countries, including China, Finland, Hong Kong, US, and South Korea, we had a mixed like we had a for education, uh, was there are, there are, for example, guide protocols uh, explained to the industry how to adopt them. Uh, but in terms of uh, of engagement, it's it's currently limited to encouraging, and uh, monitoring is limited to observing. Finally, in the UK, have the UK have its own distinct approach. I'll go back, its own distinct approach, where basically we have a we we are we have a mix of education, enforcing, and tracking through, for example, tracking adoptions through survey commissioned by uh, the Ventas Group and other association. Uh, enforcing basically it's a mandate, educating on the guide and standard and specifications are developed across the market. So moving on to the next model, which is actually the last model, uh, basically this one is showing uh, the contribution of the different stakeholders within uh, each country and across country uh, within each country in terms of uh, encouraging and driving the uh, adoption. What you could see here, you could see that the level really of the different stakeholder. We have here eight stakeholder. The level of uh, uh, the uh, responsibilities is different across within uh, within the same country and across countries. In some countries, for example, like Hong Kong and Netherlands, you can see, for example, policymakers have a much higher role than in uh, Ireland, Ireland or uh, New Zealand. In some countries, for example, like Italy, you have complete, you have uh, you have a uh, the role of policymaker is uh, completely absent. But generally, generally, if you consider all twenty countries, what the conclusion is, BIM diffusion uh, is a joint responsibility, and that's really a good news. It's a good news at the same time, but it has challenges. Challenges like. Uh, it might lead to duplication of effort. It might lead to, uh, uh, to for example, uh, uh, duplication of effort, like uh, uh, overlapping deliverable, and all the, all that kind of things. So we already thought of this, and we developed a model to avoid this kind of uh, issues. We developed this model where we, where we. Basically, for each of the eight components, which you have seen in model two, we assign a different level of responsibility to the, uh, to the eight stakeholders. If I take one component, like objective uh, stages and milestone, which is component one, you can see policymakers have a leading role uh, together with technology advocate, like uh, organization like yourself, Building Smart, and other institutions like education institution, construction organization have a supporting role 
and other organizations have a participating role like uh, technology developer, technology service provider, and you can go on for all components. So this model, it, 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 it not only it helps you to, uh, to avoid gaps in the implementation because you are making sure that all eight topics, uh, there are responsibilities assigned uh, against all eight topics that's needed on a market, and you are also avoiding duplication of effort, and you are also encouraging uh, uh, the contribution from all. So that's in terms of models. I'll move on to uh, to the, the next session, which is the next sorry uh, section, which is basically uh, the one Bilal introduced the issue with uh, BIM documents. Uh, there are difficulty in really navigating them because they're not driven by any uh, by any defined or agreed upon taxonomy. Uh, specification sometimes are as a word specification is used for example to as a word standard is used to instead of specification so what we did here we developed a taxonomy the taxonomy has two three clusters which are guide protocols and mandates and there are about 15 labels across these three clusters and uh, th there is a we wrote a book chapter on this we, can, we will share it with you we reviewed uh, the document from uh, from about uh, eight countries and we classified them uh, we basically analyzed their actual content against those uh, labels which is the 15 labels you see here and the, I have some uh, results from these eight countries. You can see the distribution, uh, the distribution of labels across the three clusters. In some countries, for example, like uh, uh, like uh, for example the U.S., you have a quite balanced distribution, and this is good. Basically, uh, there isn't gap in there. We could say there isn't a gap within their like BIM documents in some countries like Australia you can see there isn't any kind of uh, labels under the mandate uh, things and this means like a country where there is gap in some of the labels will basically might face different uh, uh, adoption challenge compared to country where the distribution is balanced. Moving on to uh, instead of just like qualifying the content of the different noteworthy publication or BIM documents, we have also developed a metric where we could uh, analyze like the relevance of uh, each of the document, and uh, it goes through those. Uh, the metric goes from R0 to R4, where R0 is redundant, R4 is uh, requisite. And we mapped uh, documents about certs. Uh, we mapped all this document from Australia, UK, and US okay, using this metric. We assessed them using this metric, and you can see really there is lots of documents that are relevant, but there are little documents. There is just a few which are recommended. Basically, they are highly authoritative, well cited uh, uh, BIM documents. So the, the, the two, if you take the, the two, uh, this metric plus the taxonomy, it will help you navigate better across uh, really the, uh, the hundreds and hundreds of BIM documents available worldwide. Uh, my last section really here is uh, uh, an example of how we really we use these models to develop a, an actual BIM policy roadmap. And the BIM policy roadmap was developed uh, for the Brazilian government was an official really consultancy. We were hired as consultant and we were hired just really because of the work we are presenting today because of our research. And the Brazilian government explicitly said, we want you guys to look at five countries and we want to learn from them. Uh, we want to learn about eight, the eight topics from the uh, five countries, which are France, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Norway, and Finland. So what we did, we uh, we started taking one component at a time, one topic at a time from model B. For example, in this case, we are looking at, uh, 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 we use basically at that time, we didn't have uh, the metrics which we presented today. We just used a traffic light system, uh, red not, not existing and goes to green under development and purple well developed. And we mapped, we mapped, uh, for example, in this case, uh, we are mapping uh, using this traffic light system component four, which are BIM documents across countries. 
you you will see in the next one in the next one we have the eight component here in the first column and we mapped them across uh, in all countries using this traffic light system and here is brazil which is the last column and we wanted to learn from countries and we look really across each line horizontally and we look countries where there are purple circles and we try to see how they have done for example if i take component one objective stage and milestone i could look at the uk netherlands finland norway and uh, and go retrospectively analyze what they ha how they have done their uh, uh, component this component one and try to propose something to brazil and this is what we have done i'll show you just how this works if you if you take if you take the BIM mandate which is component uh, one uh, this is are really the differences uh, for example the mandate in finland and norway is a standalone basically it's not embedded in a large or wider government strategy in uk and france you can see it is a part of a an official government construction strategy uh, in uk the mandate has stages and has milestone same in finland and norway uh, uh, in the uk it, it's the mandate is on new build project on renovation and it extends to the operational phase while for example in finland it's only on new build projects but it extends only uh, also to operational phase in norway it's only for new build project so we analyzed retrospectively those uh, the way mandate is done and we proposed the mandate for the brazilian government which looked like this first of all as you know Brazil is a federal country, we had uh, a federal state uh, and we were proposing a central mandate uh, and we can't, we can't influence individual state but we could influence all federally funded projects and these are house, housing, school, hospitals. So uh, we proposed a mandate which is uh, phased in, which was very interesting mandate which was phased in every, in, in four different aspects in terms of the asset type and size, in terms of the project phase, in terms of the BIM capability stage, and also in terms of uh, the project type. And the reason here, you, you see 20, could be 16, 17, we left this for them to decide. We, we, gave, them our, we gave our recommendation, but we left this to them. Uh, uh, but after this enters in force, just after two years, the mandate get changed, for example, if you see the project phase from design to construction by let's say 2016 in 2018 becomes from design to include as well operation the reason for this is when we analyzed uh using model b when we analyzed the situation in brazil using all eight components have the full picture we realized they don't have any standard like even if i'm talking about premium standards they don't have any standards that talk about uh, like uh, information or data for f operation or facility management so those two years will give time to the committees involved to develop the required standard to be extended to that phase okay so that's how we similarly we have done for for uh, the BIM guides and you can see the different approaches across the different countries for example in the uk uh, uh, we our our uh, our uh, BIM uh, standards and, uh, are basically f organized by macro project phase, capital delivery phase, basically I mean design, construction, and then operational phase. While in other countries, really, uh, the BIM guides are much more granular. Basically, they go, go into BIM use, like Finland. In another, in another country, like in Norway, for example, it's structured by BIM discipline. In the Netherlands, it's by BIM use but it's also ad hoc targeting long-term contract with, uh, with a focus on uh, O&M. So you can see different approaches as well in, uh, uh, in, uh, in developing the standard and guides in different countries. And also we analyze those retrospectively, why they look like this, why, for example, the UK we have, uh, we have them structured into macro project phase. And this goes to the premium standard, for example, in the UK we had the premium standard structured by macro project phase, which is BS 1192 2007. In Finland, they have the so called TALO, TALO 2000, which uh, were structured by, by use. So that's why, and we, we proposed an, a, a suitable uh, structure for the BIM guides uh, and standard uh, for Brazil. And, uh, and I think here, I'm trying to advance uh, the whole, uh, I'll go back here. 
the whole the whole beam guide the whole beam guide uh, the whole roid map I don't know why it keep jumping uh, the whole guide which is includes a strategy and recommendation to the Brazilian government is included in this document which you could download from this link uh, it's in Portuguese if someone is interested in the English version I'm happy to share the English version uh, with people who are interested in it. I think I concluded my part. Thank you. I'll hand uh, over again to Bilal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mohammed. Okay, in this last section, I'm going to go through it quickly, uh, just conscious of the time. Um, so I'm just going to present a simple genetic roadmap um, about how to use, uh, uh, for example, Model B. Uh, if you remember, Model B has the eight uh, components. Um, all these uh, topics that need to be covered by a policymaker as they develop their policy. Um, so these uh, eight we've already covered. We've, we've seen some of the, uh, the data about it. I just want to mention that uh, each one of these uh, topics can be assessed on their own. Um, they can, the maturity of each component can be measured, but also they can measure uh, with correspondence to other uh, topics. So it's more like a, a maturity mesh rather than a uh, scale. So we use uh, this uh, uh, model, um, for example, e against time. Uh, so of course, when we define all these models, we do not look at time. Uh, we look at the, the topics. But now for the policymaker to make good use of it, for example, for this model, you can put these eight uh, topics uh, in a column and map them against uh, a milestone in the future. For example, 2017 till 20XX. So and for each one of them, uh, you can add certain activities I'm not going to go through them now. Um, uh, you will be able uh, to go through them in a bit more detail when you receive uh, the file. So I'm just going to um, move to the next slide. Okay, let me just click them quickly. Here, I'll, I'll help you. Okay, I think we're done here. Okay, so um, now we're gonna uh, look at how to use, uh, how to develop a plan, just a sample uh, draft uh, plan in three phases. So we've got uh, an initiation uh, phase, a consultation phase, and execution phase. So if, uh, for example, policy maker, if uh, they want a generic plan uh, to apply, to develop, um, uh, they can go through these uh, three phases uh, from initiation, uh, they can first, for example, establish a task group with a clear vision, uh, develop a simple, a clear mandate, uh, develop a simple structure, and then go through it. So there, there's lots of stuff here. We're just conscious I want to leave enough time for uh, questions and answers. Um, so they develop a, you know, the, there's a, a task group to be formed, then there is a seed the policy framework, identify resources, and they use these models in different ways uh, in order to develop uh, their plan. So that's the initiation phase. And then they go through a, a consultation uh, phase where they discuss with different stakeholders uh, what, what needs to be done and to refine their framework. Um, so, for example, um, they can conduct presentations, uh, workshops, and round table discussions, etc. Uh, they can review and calibrate the, the policy framework. Um, they can identify the key dates. So, rather than just identifying the topics, they can now identify the key dates suitable for their market and then link them uh, to the activities that need, they need to do. And uh, they can, of course, publish the roadmap. And this is typically what happens in many of the countries that uh, have already um, uh, developed a policy. And uh, this uh, generic plan uh, just distills all these types of activities from across the world and provides them to policymakers to, to, to use as a template. And uh, the last phase um, here is just move. Okay. is execution. So after, after initiation and consultation, it's time to execute the policy. And there's just a, a few of these uh, recommended uh, activities, the typical activities taken by policy makers by, for example, initiating a pilot uh, program or developing an, um, an, an EIR or request for tender or developing a training program for procurers, for government agencies. 
uh, encouraging uh, the development of uh, user groups, um, you know, education task groups, uh, etc. So there's lots of uh, these activities that can, based on a, you know, an initial task group activity, developing a framework, then through consultation with uh, the industry, and then go into an execution phase. Of course, uh, what is shown here is just a, a sample of the activities, so generic activities that a policymaker can take in order to uh, develop a policy, a BIM diffusion, a BIM adoption policy across a market. So, um, in, in I'm going to just uh, stop here and uh, just summarize quickly. So, what we've shown you today is um, what I've shown you today is uh, five. Uh, models. We said there are three major problems uh, which we, we try to address. One, there are no models. So we try to develop these, we develop these five models and put them forward for industry uh, players to either assess their market maturity or to use them in developing a new policy. And we said we are, there's no benchmarks, there's no data really. So we try to collect uh, data and uh, this data is ongoing, but we will be publishing uh, the results up to December uh, 2015 uh, soon in a, in a uh, paper and uh, we've shown you a case study how it, this was applied in uh, real terms and uh, just a sample a roadmap very generic uh, roadmap based on one of the models uh, and a, a very simplified uh, plan which is common across all um, uh, policy development activities which also policymaker can use as a, a discussion starter with others um, thank you, and over back to you, Susan. Thank you very much, Bilal and Mohammed. Uh, quite a lot of work that you've put into this. Um, as the questions uh, are coming in, I think Eric, you have a handle on some of the questions in the in the box. I can ask you one to start. Are you planning on running the survey again? We, we, we would probably be collecting data as we go. Uh, these uh, data, the data changes, as Mohammed mentioned, that um, a certain country that looked in a certain way at a certain point in time will look differently after a period. So for this to be useful, we need to expand the base of the data to be collected and also recapture this data at a certain stage to see how the progression, uh, because the progression will also tell in one country will tell us or give us an indication how the progression would be in a different country. So yeah, we are hoping to expand the base from 20 countries to more and to continue collecting data uh, in, in the future. Now, we're not doing it at the moment until we publish the first set, uh, but we will do it at a later stage as well. Okay, excellent. Um, so we do have two questions here uh, and they're actually um, <laughs> They're all the same. Is why is Canada not in the list and included in the survey? <laughs> and where does Canada, where would Canada fall in the models uh, if we have data uh, from BSC? And I think that touches on, on Susan's question around, you know, participating in the survey. So I don't know if uh, you have it. Uh, was, was, was Canada on the radar on the map? How much? Yeah, definitely, definitely it was. I, I think. Uh, 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 we couldn't, the experts we contacted from Canada were very busy at the time we were doing the survey, so they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, they didn't have the, like enough time to, to fill it, but we we are still on, on time to, uh, if you uh, share with us the contact of three experts, we'll be able to send the link and we can still add uh, Canada to this set of uh, Results that Bilal mentioned will be published in, the, in a paper. So we still in we, we we can still do this. Excellent. Um, we'll definitely do that. Um, Bilal, do you have anything to add? Oh uh, no, no, no. We would love uh, to have uh, more input uh, from Canada, but we are only limited by the number <clears throat> number of specific type of experts that we can, uh, you know, have the thoughts on these topics. So it's not really an open questionnaire that anybody can answer, we, we, we seek a certain level of expertise, of knowledge of the market, uh, you know, uh, for, in order to, to keep our data valid and useful. Excellent. Um, are there, uh, so uh, just to remind, uh, as a reminder, there is a question pane. So that was, uh, those were the questions. I had three questions that were pretty much all similar. 
Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, uh, just raise their hand. I do have a couple of questions, and while I wait for uh, people to either raise their hands or uh, type questions in the question pane, um, one of the things is around uh, industry reform, and you know, the, there is the purpose behind uh, developing policy. And it's really trying to transform the industry and make it more efficient. How much of that did you see factor into the studies around the different countries that you've you've seen? How many of them really had a strategy to it was more of a reform strategy for the industry rather than really just uh, going towards BIM as a modest uh, mode of operations? Now, this is uh, it varies a lot depending on country and within the country itself, um, and depending on also the, the type of uh, building uh, sector. So, if I give an example from Australia, um, in, in many sectors there are no, uh, uh, you know, organized uh, movement to uh, organize the delivery in, in most sectors, except, for example, in large. Uh, hospitals and large health projects where, where you know the complexity of the project have forced the hand of uh, those departments health departments in order to organize themselves and identify their objectives and the levels of uh, you know uh, the development and we, what the the metadata they they need uh, so it, it forced their hand to become more structured but the picture is quite mixed and the, the, and the picture is mixed in all countries. There's not one country that has a uniform um, approach. Um, but typically, if you, if you uh, uh, without really citing too much evidence, I would say that the, 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 the percentage of structured approaches to BIM adoption is much less than a non-structured yeah. approach. Interesting. I have a question here from Adam Matthews. Uh, Adam, I will put you online. I've unmuted you. So uh, your mic is now live and you can ask your question, Adam. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, uh, Susan. Thanks, Harry. Um, just a quick question. Well, first of all, a comment. Uh, Bilal and Mohammed, a lot of good work. I think as Susan said, so thanks for taking us through that. Um, I guess what my question is really relating to some of the work we're doing here in Europe, as I think you're aware, we've got this European BIM task, group, which is essentially a coming together of currently about 16 countries around Europe to look at how we can align policies, at least align some of the thinking for how we introduce BIM into our own uh, national programs, uh, policy programs, or procurement frameworks. So my question relates to that in terms of alignment, and I wondered if you'd done any work or were planning to do any work that specifically would allow us to identify some of the common principles, some of the common practices that appear probably in your model under some of the the document layer so the mandate layer the uh, protocol layer and the well i'm less less concerned about the guidance level level for the moment but probably all three so do you have any observations to comment on or future plans around some of the reoccurring themes in the developed programs that you've recorded and observed. Bilal, you would like? Yep, yep, okay. Um, uh, alignment is the most difficult thing to really approach, and uh, I don't really envy you, <laughs> if you roll Adam and what you're trying to you know, establish across these countries, but uh, there are some common things to, to, to look at, uh, you know, um, you, you mentioned, for example, uh, uh, protocols. If we look at the, one of the eight components, uh, the, what we call noteworthy BIM publications, these are the, the easier to identify for alignment. So alignment of standards is an easy one because we can all agree that we, we want to uh, you know, adopt, for example, an ISO document when it comes to you know, certain things. Uh, uh, we can also look at it. Technology infrastructure is an easy one to align uh, because, uh, you know, especially in the area you're, you're working, uh, this is not really a, a, a big issue. You, you can uh, agree to align on open standards, open BIM, um, uh, etc. But it becomes more tricky when there is market-specific dynamics, which are different from one country to another. So a country like uh, Spain, for example, or Italy, will be very, very different to a country like Sweden or Finland. So alignment when it comes to diffusion dynamics cannot 
cannot occur. So really, the, 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 the alignment should be on the, on the objectives, not on ways of going there. Uh, so it's, it's nearly about separating between uh, what needs to be achieved and how to be achieved. Uh, aligning how things are achieved will be very difficult uh, in my view. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, one time for maybe one last question. Uh, here I have uh, from, uh, I think it's one of your colleagues, uh, Huda Daiwu. Uh, so Daiwu, uh, so, so you're on, uh, you're on uh, uh, Huda? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to have to, maybe you could type your question um, in the, um, in the, uh, in the, the, the box. Uh, Adam, I'll re I'll unmute you uh, just as if you have a follow up question. Uh, yeah, I did. Well, I, I think in terms of getting to, to allow your point about uh, not envying me, um, I'm not sure I would envy me at the moment. Um, but I, I think the the challenge is probably to look at some of the principles. So I, um, we may have missed it. Maybe we have a follow up conversation because I think we can't align at the specific level of national legislation or contracts and so on that wasn't really what i was i was really more looking at what some of the principles are around how uh, bim has been encouraged for example specifying information requirements eirs for you know as a, as a tangible example of a principle that perhaps we could all agree to rather than the the actual contractual layer of um of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a, you know, a procurement form that's used in a different country. That's that's probably not where we're going to align. Uh, so I think we need to look more at principles. But again, I'm happy to have a follow-up conversation with you some other time. Yeah. Thanks again. Uh, thank Present. you. Uh, I, I totally agree uh, with uh, with your comment, uh, Adam. It's if it's about uh, you know if identifying an objective. A, a measurable objective, let's say a document, an EIR, a BMP, um, a standard, a classification, uh, a alignment can occur. Anything that is measurable can occur. It's the difficulty, as you, you, you know, is more about the social aspects of adoption. And these are not a small part of any adoption mechanism. This is where I think the difficulty is. And this is what the difficulty is within the same country, you know, within, between different states between the different cultures, this is where it's very difficult. Aligning around documents, aligning around statements as uh, uh, standards is, is something that is achieve, achievable and must be done, and uh, I commend you for what you're doing. Um, well, thank you for that. Uh, I think it's one of the problems that we're having facing in Canada is the, the fat multifaceted or federated approach. So we have federal, provincial, and municipal governments, which all play a, a huge portion. And uh, I, spoke, I think you spoke to it about in Brazil that you, you started with a federal mandate. Um, so we're at time. Uh, I'll let uh, Susan uh, take over and end the meeting. Thank you all again for attending and thank you for, for being here. Uh, Susan, uh, I'll let you present uh, next, next week's, uh, ne sorry, next, next month's uh, meeting and uh, let you uh, end the meeting. Thanks, Eric. Um, and not to take away from our speakers today, definitely uh, we'll be following up and seeing if we can't, uh, Bilal and Mohammed, give you some names of people that would fit within your criteria uh, in order to do, uh, to get Canada um, assessed, if you will, um, and on the, uh, get us on the right track of some recommendations. So we will follow up with you. Um, and again, not to detract from today, but we are announcing our next meeting at the end of April. Uh, we have David Philp uh, from the UK BIM Task Group uh, who will present on his version of the top 10 things to do to get a government mandate. A few jokes I'm sure will be in there as well. Um, Adam, you might be able to speak to that too. Uh, so we encourage you uh, to attend our next meeting Thursday, April 28th. Uh, we will have it at our usual time at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. And we look forward to continuing the conversation of the government mandate um, and, and determining actionable items for us to take here in Canada. So thanks everyone for joining and uh, feel free to send us a message at information at ibc-bsc.ca if you have any questions or comments. Thanks very much everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.